Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last uh, Kaiser Spring Lecture of 2021. Uh, before we start, the rules are the same as they were the weeks before. If you have questions, please put them in the chat so Mike can read them to our speaker. You can put the questions in the chat during the lecture or after it or anytime you want, but they will only be answered after the lecture. More, moreover, if you want to turn on your camera, you are free to do so, but nothing terrible will happen to you if you don't, so it's your own choice. Uh, we will record the lecture, but even if you turn on your camera, you won't be seen on video, so don't worry about that. In today's lecture, we will finish our journey through the solar system by looking at how it all started. We will learn if our solar system's formation was normal and in this way seek again for an answer to our fundamental question, are we unique? Our speaker of today is Dr. Melissa McClure. She's an assistant professor here in Leiden and researches how planets come to be to researches how planets come to be by studying dust grains, uh, by studying how dust grains evolve to baby planets. Enjoy. All right, let me share the screen. Okay. Can everybody see this now? Cool. All right. Awesome. So thank you guys all for coming out on a Saturday to, to hear me talk. Um, full disclosure, this is my first time giving a public lecture to an audience this big, so I think it's really exciting that you guys are all here on a Saturday. Um, and uh, I, I see quite a few familiar faces, both from the class that I'm teaching and some family members, so hi everyone. Um, so I, I'm hoping today to uh, give you sort of a, a tour of how our solar system uh, came to be formed. It's something that I'm really excited about. As, as was said, I, I do my, my research um, in, in a, a very similar topic to this. So um, I'm hoping that you guys get excited about this as well. Um, and let's see, hopefully there's no technical issues. Yes, okay. So the really big picture questions that we have in astronomy today, um, as was hinted at just a moment ago, are the question of how did we get here and are we alone? These all have to do with how unique our, our solar system is. So what I'm hoping to do uh, today is to focus on how did we on Earth get here in our solar system? And that will, will impact a little bit on the question of whether we're likely to find um, other uh, other life elsewhere in other exoplanetary systems. It's not a question we're going to answer today completely at all, but it's something that we'll certainly uh, touch on and hint at. Um, all right, so the outline for the lecture today is that I'll first uh, introduce you to some basic structures in the solar system and make a, a short comparison with exoplanets because I know uh, one of the previous Kaiser lectures um, already took a, a much more intensive look at exoplanets. Um, then I'll talk uh, about the, the process of star and planet formation, so how you go from a, a big cloud of cold gas and dust into a star plus a system of planets. Um, then I'll specifically focus on the, the timeline for when um, individual events within our solar system uh, planet formation sequence happened. Um, and then I'll compare those uh, events that we see in the solar system with what we see in some protoplanetary disks, which are what form exoplanetary systems. Um, and finally, I'll, I'll tie up with um, some future directions for where we can go to get more information about this problem um, and look at habitability. All right, so um, first we need to define what we mean when we talk about our solar system. So um, this is defining the we in here in this question of how we got here. So the solar system is composed of one star, we call it the sun. It's a G2 dwarf, which means it's sort of a yellowish dwarf with a temperature around 5,500 uh, centigrade. It's about four and a half billion years old. So that's our first ingredient for what defines our solar system. We also know that we have eight planets, including uh, four terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. These are small rocky planets that are uh, poor in, in terms of like atmospheric uh, thickness. They, they don't have very big atmospheres. Um, and they're also dry. So even though we think of Earth as being water rich, it's actually, we'll see in a moment, um, not that water rich. It's got relatively little water. Um, there's also four additional planets, 
well, two additional planets that we call gas giants. So these are Jupiter and Saturn. They're much, much larger than the terrestrial planets. They have thick atmospheres um, that are gas rich um, and, and they're big. And then we have two more gas giants, which we now call ice giants, actually, um, Uranus and Neptune. They're not quite as large as, the, the, as Jupiter and Saturn, the gas giants, but they still have thick gaseous atmospheres and they are rich in um, molecules that you would find in ices. So they're, they're very icy components. Um, in addition to the planets, we also have two debris belts. So one, a uh, belt called the asteroid belt. It's got rocky collisional debris. Fair warning, I'm a classic rock fan, so I've included a couple of bad puns in this, in this presentation. Um, and the second debris belt that we have is the Kuiper belt. So famous Dutch person, uh, this is a belt of icy collisional debris. It's analogous to the asteroid belt, but further out in the solar system where the temperature is much colder. So you have a variety of different types of ices. Um, it's the, uh, the formation region for comets um, or where comets originate. Um, even though we see comets crossing from the, the Kuiper belt through the solar system and close to the sun, they, they originated out here. And it contains a reservoir that uh, has water ice in it that may have provided water to Earth despite Earth being dry. So these are our basic components in, in the solar system. Um, and now I want to just very, very briefly touch on how we fit in with, um, how we compare with exoplanet systems. So you may have seen a plot like this in one of the previous lectures um, looking at exoplanets. So this is a a uh, plot that shows the number of planets uh, per star as a function of the planet size, and it's normalized to the size of Earth. Um, so the different categories here are you have things that are slightly less than Earth in size, um, then you have uh, um, uh, planets that are a little bit larger than Earth, up to two times the size of Earth. Those are called uh, super-Earths. Then we have small Neptunes, which are things that are larger than super-Earths, but smaller than ne Neptune actually is in real life. Um, then we have things the size of Neptunes and things the size of Jupiter. Um, you can see from this plot that, uh, so, so this is a, a very large survey of recently discovered exoplanets, that super-Earths and small Neptunes dominate the size distribution for, for exoplanets, um, with the caveat that these are just the exoplanets that we know so far. Um, and we don't actually have either of those two types of planets in our solar system. So if we compare our solar system with this distribution, um, Earth is obviously here at the location of one Earth size, obviously. <laughs> um, and all of the terrestrial planets would, would be smaller than, than Earth. Um, and the gas giant planets and the ice giant planets that we have are all um, pretty large. So, so ranging here from Neptune up to Jupiter. So you see that we've neatly bracketed uh, with our solar system, the actual most common types of planets. So we, we have two types of planets that are relatively uh, less common than the average types of planets here. Um, so one caveat on this be before I, I go further is that these are planets that are um, due to observational biases known to be within the orbit of Mercury around their, their central stars. So it may be that once we get observational techniques that can probe further out um, around other stars, maybe we see more planets that resemble our own. But for right now, this is the sample of exoplanets that we have to work with. So um, we're just going to say for right now that our solar system is not uh, closely similar to most exoplanets that we see. In fact, if we were to put a number on it, um, our combination of having a solar G2 type star with at least one uh, Jupiter sized planet is actually pretty rare. So only 1% of the, of the stars that uh, of the uh, planetary systems around solar type stars have a Jupiter like gas giant planet. The others all have planets that are smaller than that. So within this context, our solar system seems pretty unusual. And this is a, a kind of radical change for how we used to think about our solar system. Um, we sort of think that the solar system is this nice, classical, calm, sedate 
thing because it's where we we grew up. So you know, it's it's normal to us. Um, but in reality, we may actually be or our solar system may be a space oddity. This is our our evolving modern view of of the solar system. So in order to address the question of why our solar system appears to be different from other planetary systems, we need to consider how did the solar system form. So what I'm going to do right now is take you through a, a basic introduction to star formation followed by planet formation. Um, I'm going to define a bunch of terms that we'll use later on in, in the talk. Um, it has lots of pretty pictures. I really like this part. So enjoy. Um, so we know that stars form in dense cold molecular clouds. So if we if we think about the, the space in between stars, we have um, what we would call the interstellar medium. That's just all of this space in between everything. And then there are these denser regions here um, called molecular clouds. This is a famous image from the Hubble Space Telescope called the, the Pillars of Creation, um, where radiation from all of the stars in the interstellar medium is, is basically carving out these long, tall pillars where the there's gas and dust and it's colder within these pillars than it is in the surrounding region. So if we focus in on one region of these molecular clouds um, here, we can see that um, if we section off a particularly dense part of it, we'll, we'll call this a, a pre-stellar core. Now this is a, uh, a region where you have cold gas and cold dust. Um, and at some point you become, uh, you, you have the, the temperature in this region cools down enough um, that for the density of the material that you, you have, um, you can no longer support the material against gravitational collapse. So normally you would support it with, with thermal energy and you can't do that anymore. So at some point, one of these cores starts to collapse. We define that from a star formation perspective as our T equals zero for the star formation process. Then that collapsing core will eventually form a structure that we call a protostar. So you have a very young star at the center of this. Um, there's a, an envelope of material that's, that's basically feeding that molecular cloud material from the cloud onto the structure called a protoplanetary disk. Um, so you funnel material like this on from the cloud onto the disk. Once it's in the disk, that material spirals in until it lands onto the central star. And that's how the star builds up its mass. That's how you form the star. And this takes place between 10,000 and 100,000 years after you start to collapse your cloud. So there's a, a, another stage in the star and planet formation uh, sequence where at some point when you reach about half a million to 1 million years old after your t equals zero, you basically clear out this remaining envelope material. So you've drained all of that mass from that, that uh, pre-stellar core onto your disk. And that mass is still spiraling in toward the central star. By this point, you built up most of the mass of the central star. So it's really only a small amount of mass that's left in the disk. Um, and this is when you start to see signs of planets in, in disks that we observe in, um, in other, other uh, molecular clouds. Um, and this, is, this phase lasts between about one and 10 million years. From here, um, then, a lot of time passes. So we go from uh, around 10 million years to four and a half billion years. So, so this is like a, a factor of uh, a thousand more. You end up with something like the solar system. So you have uh, a star surrounded by planets. You don't have any gas left in, in, this, in this disk. It, that's all been dissipated back at this stage. Um, and you have some debris belts. And in this case, you would end up with something like the Earth, where we, we see us now at four and a half billion years from when we started. So in this sequence of events, this is how you form the star. Planets form during this part of the sequence. So if we want to understand how the solar system forms, we need to look at what the processes are that occur in disks at, at this point in time. So I'm going to zoom in on, on this and give a, a basic recipe for how you would form planets. So let's say that you, you take that nice pretty picture of a disk and you replace it with this very, very simple cartoon where you have your central star and you have your disk and you've got material that's spiraling in toward the star. 
Um, this material would consist of both gas and dust, as did the molecular cloud. Um, and the first step in forming planets is that you need to grow your solid dust, dust grains by sort of bottom up step by step collisions with each other into things that are about one centimeter in size and we'll call those pebbles. So this is what one of one of those might look like. Once you have your, your, your pebbles, you need to concentrate them radially at one location. If you're going to make a planet, you need to get the ingredients and put it together where they can actually get in contact with each other. So you radially concentrate material, um, these, these solid pebbles. Then you need to find a way to, to concentrate them sort of in one particular location, not just in a ring. And then you have a cook up a planet. And I'll get back to this momentarily. We're just going to say magic happens here you have some way that you form the planet and we'll elaborate on that in a moment. And if your planet is large enough, then it may actually uh, grow and carve out a gap in its protoplanetary disk. And this is something that we could observe directly. Um, over time, the, it, once you, we carve a gap in the disk, the central part of the disk continues to drain off onto the central star. But because you have this gap, um, any material in the outer part of the disk has a hard time making it to the star. So eventually over time, this material will form some kind of debris belt. And when you drain the material in the inner disk onto the star, you may reveal a terrestrial sized planet. So now I have this cook up a planet step. Let's break that down into a little bit more detail and see what that actually means. Um, so there are different, a few different competing ways that you could cook up a planet. Um, but first, before we go into those, let's let's take a step back and say, okay, well, what 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 are the terms that we're going to use to describe how you would cook up a planet? So you have to go when you make a planet from something that's very small, like some of these micron-sized dust grains, up to something that's um, thousands of kilometers in size. If we're talking like Earth or Jupiter, so we have these these different intermediate stages. So we have dust, which is what we saw in the molecular clouds. That's on the on the size scale of a few microns. Then we have pebbles. Um, this is an example of a pebble that we'll see later in the talk. Those are between one millimeter and one centimeter in size. Pebbles will lead to what we call planetesimals, which are something that is at least a kilometer in size. Examples of those include the asteroids that we talked about earlier, as well as comets, including this comet 67P, which we'll see later in the talk. Um, and then planetesimals will eventually form, or may eventually form planets. And planets are things that are um, on the order of a thousand kilometers in size, and you can either form terrestrial planets or gas giants or super Earths or mini Neptunes, as we saw earlier. Um, so those are the terms that we'll be using in, in this discussion. So what are the competing ways that we have to cook up a planet? Well, one theory that, that's a classical theory that's been around since the 1980s, um, or actually, I think even before that, but officially since the 1980s, is that you, you have what's called core accretion. So basically you take um, the method that you use to build up dust grains and you just extrapolate that to larger sizes. You say that you have step-by-step -step collisions that happen between similarly sized bodies. So dust grains, collide to form pebbles, pebbles collide to form boulders, boulders collide to form planetesimals, planetesimals collide to form planets, um, terrestrial planets collide to form gas giants. And at some point, the, the planet becomes massive enough that you have a runaway gas accretion process that um, basically uh, accretes the atmosphere of a gas giant very rapidly if you grow that large. So this is considered to be a bottom-up approach. It's, it's easy to understand. But it has one major problem, and this is what we call the meter barrier problem. So basically, once you reach things that are a meter in size, if you collide two meter sized bodies, they're much more likely to fragment than they are to grow and, and stick in accrete from that position on. So basically, these collisions um, become increasingly violent the larger your, your, your uh, colliding uh, partners become, and they basically you, you, you just hit this barrier where you can't grow anything larger than a meter with this method. So that's a problem because you know we're sitting on something that's much larger than a meter so we know that this has to there has to be a way around this problem. So 
um, an alternative uh, theory that was proposed that could get around this is gravitational instability. In this particular theory, you have a cloud of gas and dust, much like the, the, the it's specifically within the disk, but usually in like colder regions of the disk. And much like the initial collapse of that pre-stellar core that we talked about, um, this, this cloud of dust and gas collapses directly to form a planet. But there's uh, this, this is called, considered sort of a top-down approach, and it essentially vaults over the meter barrier by completely ignoring it and going straight to forming a gas giant planet. But the one problem with this is that you can't use it to form terrestrial planets, and uh, because you, you, you would have a lot of the gas that's also included in this clump of material that would also collapse onto the planet and form an atmosphere. So we know we have terrestrial planets, so this can't be the main uh, way that we form planets. So there are um, more recent alternatives to these two theories that have been proposed, um, including one which is a modification of the gravitational instability uh, method. And in this, in this approach, you basically take smaller perturbations or smaller denser regions in the inner parts of disks rather than in the cold outer parts of disks. And because these, these um, over density regions are, are smaller, you, when you collapse them, you can basically form a planetesimal instead of a gas giant. Um, and this means that instead of vaulting over the meter barrier and hitting the gas giants, you're vaulting over it and just hitting the planetesimal class over here. Once you do this, then you can actually take your planetesimals and grow them by a couple different methods. You could either still do your core accretion method, but you're just skipping this first step and going straight to this collisions between planetesimals. And then um, it's actually possible to, to merge them successfully if the velocities between them are slow enough. Um, sorry, there is a fly buzzing around my face. Um, that's one way you could approach it. And alternatively, um, there's another method for, for growing your planets where you have a planetesimal and it basically acts like a snowball that you roll in snow. You have tiny little snowflakes. Um, and when you roll the snowball through the snowflakes, it just picks them up and they glom on. So um, this would be you, you, you take the planetesimal and you essentially have it move through a cloud of these centimeter sized pebbles in the protoplanetary disk and it hoovers them up um, and they they just they add quite a bit of mass without needing to be big themselves so it's a collision between a large uh, object the planetesimal and small objects the the pebbles and because of that you don't break up the planetesimal you build it up very slow um, you can build it up very quickly through these small but constant interactions into a proper sized planet. This is the method that's currently preferred and I'll, I'll show you why based on evidence from the solar system. Okay, so these are the methods that you use to form planets, but we want to take a little closer look at these steps in here as you're going from something that's a planetesimal in size to something that's a planet in size, um, because there's some important heating mechanisms that we'll, we'll see in a moment. Um, so specifically, as you go through these steps, you go from having a planetesimal that looks like just a pile of, you know, the, these, these pebbles put on top of each other. So it looks like a rubble pile. Um, and there are, uh, uh, radioactive elements within the solid particles that make up this rubble pile that start to heat up. They break down and they start to produce heat. And that causes uh, the, the planetesimal to have internal heating, which starts to um, take the rocks and basically melt them. So you end up with the sequence of events where you form a magma ocean in, inside your planetesimal with a, a cooler crust on top. And eventually, if the planetesimal is large enough and this heating goes on for long enough, you'll actually um, melt all of the rock in your planetesimal. And uh, basically, the denser materials like iron and nickel, that the metals will sink toward the, the center of the planet. And, and basically form a, a core there. And then the lighter materials, like the, the rocky silicate materials, will float on top of that core. And then you'll have a, a cold or cooler crust on top of that. 
So the signature of having a fully formed planet is that it's been differentiated like this. We, we call this this differentiation when, when, you, when you heat up the, the planet and segregate the metals into the center and the rocks onto the surface. Um, and it's important uh, to see this sequence because we can use this sequence in our own solar system to see when this when these different formation um, or when these different stages occurred. Um, and that's because each of these stages produces um, different types of fragments. If, if you disrupt the, the planetesimal as it's forming, <laughs> I'm going to get this fly at some point, um, then uh, you, you can basically have fragments that will fall to Earth as meteorites, so shooting stars. Um, when you have the unprocessed rubble pile and you take a fragment of that and send it to Earth, then it's what we call a chondrite. And we'll, again, see this in a moment. It's this sort of mixed uh, mixed texture. It looks like you just took a bunch of, of pebbles and sand and stuck them together. Um, as you start to differentiate the, the planets and then fragment them, you get um, meteorites that come from different regions of the planet. So there's this uh, this type of meteorite called an iron meteorite, which is a sample of planetesimal cores or planetary cores. And then there's another type of meteorite called an achondrite, which comes from this rocky or rocky silicate rich crust or, or, or mantle. Um, and we can use uh, examples of, of these different meteorites to actually construct a timeline for when different objects in the solar system formed. So we can um, this is how this is how we'll display that that timeline. Um, so if you think back to the the pretty picture sequence of star formation, this is taking that sequence and laying it out in a linear scale on on a timeline. So you have these two stages are that protostellar stage where you still have the envelope that's falling down onto the disk and the disk is still spiraling onto the star. Um, and this is that uh, in purple, that protoplanetary disk stage where you've cleared out your, your protostellar envelope and you're, you're moving material through the disk in a spiral pattern onto the central star. Um, the time scale on this is time in millions of years. So um, you'll notice these early stages don't take up very much time. <laughs> Most of the time is spent in the disk stage. And we'll uh, start adding, adding events into this diagram. So what we're going to do with the meteorites is we will uh, take the meteorites and measure different isotopes in them to age date when the planetesimals from which these meteorites originated when they formed. There's different systems to do this. I'm not going to go into this in detail because it's not my, this particular uh, subfield is not my area of expertise, but um, I'll talk you through the results from it. Um, and once you've they've we've uh, gotten um, uh, meteorites age dated, then we can compare the amounts of other materials within those meteorites to to understand where the meteorites formed in the solar system. Because if the meteorites contain ingredients that are typically seen in in ices versus rocks, then we would know that they came from different regions of the solar system, either further out or further in. So. Each type of meteorite that we saw in the on the previous slide will tell us something different about this formation timeline. So let's look first at the, the chondrites. Remember, these were the unprocessed rubble piles that were sort of the first step in planetesimal formation. They can actually give us, uh, because they haven't been uh, differentiated, they haven't been processed, they contain original material from when the solar system forms. So they give us a complete history of the solar system's uh, protoplanetary disk. So these meteorites basically come to Earth, they impact Earth, they burn up a little bit. Um, that gives them this sort of fusion crust on the outside, this, this blackened region. Um, and then you, you, you find them just lying in fields, whatever fragments are left after they, they hit Earth. If you take a slice um, through this meteorite, then you'll see this, uh, this texture that we saw on the previous page, where it looks like you have many different inclusions that are stuck together by some kind of glue. So if we look at the different components, you can see this big fluffy thing is 
a piece of rock that is rich in both calcium and, and aluminum. Now, these types of these elements are things that um, only only exist or they exist. They're formed mostly at high temperature environments. So they formed in the inner part of our solar system. And when we age date them, they're the oldest solids that we see in our solar system. It's also worth noting that they're about one to 10 centimeters in size. So they're sort of comparable to these pebbles that we need to start planet formation. Another component that we see in these uh, chondrite meteorites is chondrules, or chondrules, I'm probably not pronouncing this correctly. Um, but uh, these are these uh, spherical shaped droplets. So they, they contain a lot of metal, so iron and nickel. Um, and they're younger based on their ages than the calcium aluminum rich inclusions. So they actually span the whole range of the protoplanetary disk lifetime as we'll see in a moment. And in, in between these different elements, we have what's called the matrix, not Keanu Reeves, the matrix, but um, it's a mixture of tiny, tiny dust grains. So these micron sized particles that are some of which originated in the molecular cloud um, and haven't been processed since then. And some of which are things that came off of, of forming planetesimals that were knocked off in collisions. So you see a mixture of materials in this matrix, some of which must have originated in hot regions and some of which must have originated in cold regions. And this means that there was radial mixing between the different regions of the solar system when it was, was forming. And we'll come back to that momentarily. Um, so if we look at um, the next type of meteorite, these are the iron rich meteorites. We remember we said these were the melted cores of, of differentiated uh, planets or planetesimals. So one of the great places to find these is in the Sahara Desert because it's very dry so the iron will rust. Um, so when we look at some of these meteorites, you can tell just looking at them that they look different from the chondrites. They look more like you think of a space rock, right? Um, and if you cut them open, you see that they don't have the same uh, inside components that the chondrites did. These are very uniform. Um, they don't have any uh, substructures. They're just pure metal that's mixed. But what you can see is that they have this texture, this sort of cross, uh, sort of A-shaped, triangular-shaped cross, uh, crossing patterns. And that comes from them having a crystalline texture. And that means that they must have been melted at some point and then cooled um, within some specific time frame, which is a, a signature of them coming from a, a differentiated uh, planetesimal or differentiated planet. So one of these heat processed planets. So because you could only have this happen in the core of a planet, this means that we know that these meteorites must have um, basically been part of the uh, uh, generation of, of small planets that, sorry, small, small planetesimals that eventually became uh, planets later on. And when we age date them, we can see that some of these are very, very young. So planet formation must have started early in our solar system. Um, and I'll show you in, in a moment um, that uh, where they fit into this, this time timeline that we started to set up. Um, the third type of meteorite that we, we can look at are the ones that we called achondrites. And this was um, the uh, meteorites that basically came from the, the mantle of a differentiated planet. So they were rich in like uh, silicate rocks, but not so much in metals. So some of these even came from Mars. You had a, a impact on Mars that broke off a chunk. It flew around in the asteroid belt for, for billions of years and eventually landed on Earth um, where we can observe it today. Um, and you can see that they sort of have a, a texture that's a little bit more glassy. They look a little bit more like something like um, volcanic that you might find on Earth. Um, but based on their, their um, uh, chemistry, they, they can't have formed on Earth. They don't match anything we have on Earth, but they do match the different elemental ratios that we would see on Mars. So these suggest that Mars and, and probably the other terrestrial planets um, had a partially accreted and partially melted and differentiated by the time these meteorites were ejected. 
So we can put all of these things together back into our timeline. And we can say the chondritic meteorites, the, the ones that were the rubble piles, um, they had these calcium aluminum rich inclusions and these, these uh, small iron spherules. And those basically set the beginning and the end of when our, our solar system's protoplanetary disk stage lasted. So this means that you can start forming planets um, by something like a, a, a streaming instability with a pebble accretion method as soon as you get these, these CAIs forming. And you could continue with this method of planet formation for about 3 million years. So it sets the beginning and end stages of planet formation in our solar system. In contrast, the iron-rich meteorites, um, which come from the first planetesimals in the asteroid belt, those had to have formed pretty early. So they're right after the formation of calcium aluminum rich inclusions, which suggests that this pebble accretion method may have actually, um, the streaming instability and pebble accretion method may have been the way to, to grow planets in the solar system. And if we put Mars in there, Mars accreted later than, than these first um, iron rich uh, meteorites. So, it, but it does mean that you partially form your terrestrial planets within the lifetime of the protoplanetary disk, which really reemphasizes why studying this particular stage is so important to us. Um, we can also look at what, what happens with comets. Comets were one of the other components that we saw in our definition of the solar system, and we want to see how those formed as well. So there was a mission to actually go to a comet and collect cometary material and bring it back. This was in the early 2000s. It was called the Stardust Sample Return Mission. Um, so the Stardust uh, uh, probe went to this comet called Vild2, and little dust grains from the, uh, that comet impacted the Stardust probe, and they produced these um, these tracks. So basically, Stardust took this like jelly-like material, sort of like Jello except denser, and flew with it through the field of this this comet's tail, collected all of this material, and then brought it back to Earth. Um, so these sort of uh, frost-like features, these long tracks, these are where a dust grain um, entered the, the gel on this side and then traveled through the material and ended up over here. And these little dots at the end are what's left of those dust grains when they got back to Earth. So if we look at in more detail at some of these dust grains, we see something really surprising. So um, some of these grains include these really shiny uh, gem-like features, and these are actually um, the, the, the gem called olivine. So if you think of like the August birthstone peridot, if anyone gets birthstone jewelry for anybody in their life, um, this, this is like a, a green gemstone. It's really bright and shiny, and it's, it's this material called olivine. So this material is, is really abundant in, in uh, 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 space. So we, we, we see these gemstones in comets, but the surprising feature is that you had to have had a really hot environment in order to form these. And they're seen in comets. Comets have ices, you, they're cold. You don't expect to see hot things in a cold thing. It would be like, you know, finding like barbecue in your ice cream cone or something. So we, this is another piece of evidence that, um, uh, along with age dating these comets, so the comets formed late, but there was a lot of radial mixing in the, the solar system's protoplanetary disk that incorporated this hot material into colder regions of the disk as well. Um, and this will be, again, important um, in, in a moment. One other mission that we had to a comet was Rosetta, which was a recent mission by the European Space Agency that took these fabulous data of this comet uh, called Comet 67P. It's the one that looks like a rubber ducky. You sort of see the head here and, and the neck and then the body over there. Um, so uh, 67P went, sorry, Rosetta went to 67P and orbited it and took a bunch of measurements and it actually even sent down a probe, um, the, the Philae rover, I think. And it returned a lot of information about the composition of this, this comet. So the comet has both simple ices uh, listed here, like water, uh, carbon dioxide, ammonia, methane, carbon monoxide, as well as a number of other 
more complex ice species, which are basically long uh, molecules that are made up of many different carbon atoms mixed with other different atoms. Um, and basically, the, the whole comet was just very rich in carbon. Um, and this is, this is exciting because carbon is one of the things that's important to forming life on Earth. So understanding how, um, how these, these comets were created or made is, is one of the critical things that we need to understand if we want to understand whether um, we might see life in other, other locations. So if we put the comet information into the timeline, um, here we, we, we basically see that you're able to form Kuiper Belt planetesimals, aka comets, at around the 3 million year mark. Um, and again, they also show that there's a lot of mixing within the, the uh, uh, protoplanetary disk for the solar system. So then we have the last bit in our story about how the solar system formed, is that we need to know what happened to the gas giants. Why do we have gas giants and what, do, what impact did they have on the other components in our solar system? So gas giants have to have formed within this um, sort of three to four million year window when you have gas in your protoplanetary disk because they're gas giants, so they have a thick gaseous atmosphere, so they have to have formed while you still have gas around them in the disk. Um, and if we look at the composition of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, by and large, they're mostly made up of hydrogen and helium with a few um, uh, additional icy elements thrown in there. Um, so you need to, to basically form when you still have hydrogen and helium in your disk. Now, um, one of the ways that we can we, we can't actually test anything about the composition of these, these planets directly through meteorites because all of the, the solid rocky material in these gas giants would be down in the core. And we don't even know if it's really rock. It might be like some weird metallic form uh, of, of uh, material there. So instead of having meteorites that come from these planets and come to Earth, we actually have to look at the meteorites that we have and say, is there evidence that there was some environmental effect um, on their formation that was caused by these gas giants? So to give you an example of that, um, if we look at a certain type of meteorite called an angerite, these came from the molten uh, uh, mantles of, of, of planets. There are another type of these, these achondrite meteorites. So they were molten at one point and they, um, if you measure the magnetic field in these meteorites, it should be the same as the magnetic field of the protoplanetary solar disk at the time when these planetesimals were molten because it would have been frozen in to the, the planetesimal. So if we, people have, have studied these, um, these fragments and basically the angerites can be age dated to about 4 million years after your T equals zero for the solar system but they don't have any magnetic field, which means that at 4 million years uh, after, after your t equals zero, then you basically had no magnetic field um, in your disk. And that meant you had no gas in your disk at that point. So we can use this 4 million year old mark as sort of a cutoff for when um, the gas left the, the solar system's protoplanetary disk. Um, so this must mean that uh, these, these um, Jupiter must have basically formed before the 4 million year old mark in our disk. So one might then ask the question, okay, so that's the end of when Jupiter started forming, but when did it start? In order to understand this question, we can look, uh, take advantage of the compositional gradient that we see in the solar system. If we go back to this picture where we have all of the planets lined up, um, then there's a sort of general trend that we see where you have warmer materials, or sorry, the, the, the um, terrestrial planets are dry and don't have uh, much water or, or, or carbon or things like that in them. And they're also in a warmer region of the disk. And the uh, gas giants and ice giants are have more ice material in them and are in a colder region of the disk. So there's this location just inside Jupiter's orbit that we call the snow line. And this is basically where um, water and other things that would exist as ices would be ice outside of the snow line. 
and they would be in the in the gas in the disk inside of the snow line. It's similar to the effect that you see if you look at a mountain where, where you go above a certain elevation, you suddenly see snow. And when you're below that elevation, there is no snow because there's a temperature gradient going up the mountain. Um, so we, we see that effect in the, the solar system. Um, so if we look at uh, now um, Jupiter, so or sorry, if, if we look at the, the timeline for which Jupiter would have formed, before Jupiter formed, you would have had all of this mixing going on in the, the solar system disk. So remember, we saw evidence in the comets and evidence in the asteroids that there was radial mixing. But then at some point, um, we look at uh, meteorites that are a certain age, and they show two different populations, and those populations didn't mix at all. Um, in this, we, we can see this with the iron meteorites. Some of them are carbon rich, while others of them are carbon poor. Um, we assume based on the temperature gradient that the uh, carbon rich iron meteorites formed outside of the snow line at, at colder temperatures and the iron, uh, sorry, carbon uh, poor meteorites formed in the inner part of the solar system. So when you age date these, these systems, the carbon poor meteorites are older, indicating that they formed first. So you basically formed, formed them inside of, of uh, the, the snow line, and they didn't have any interaction with the material outside of the snow line. Um, and the, the best way to do that is if something physically isolated those two populations, and that something is Jupiter. So basically Jupiter growing large enough to open that gap in the disk that we saw when we talked about how planets form, that happens. And basically you can't move any material from the outer disk into that inner disk anymore. So it physically isolates it. Um, and this basically stops mixing um, through some period of time while, while Jupiter is still forming. So if we put that back into our diagram, you see that uh, Jupiter's form Jupiter's core must have formed before about 1 million years um, after uh, the, the solar system started forming. And then it completed its formation in terms of its uh, giant atmosphere by about 4 million years. So these, this is the complete timeline with all of the different components that we have um, in our solar system. And if we relate this timeline back to the methods by which we think planets formed, we can get a diagram that's kind of like this. So on the y-axis, you have the planet size in terms of, of its mass. So you have small dust grains down here, things that are about one uh, Earth in size here, and gas giants up there. And you have uh, time on the x-axis in, in logarithmic units. So basically, for, for Jupiter, you start forming your calcium aluminum rich inclusions here. The, the, the first pebbles that we see in our, in our solar system form there. Then we start to see evidence at around 100,000 years for, for the first planetesimals. Um, and if these, these um, planetesimals formed beyond the, the, the snow line, they had a lot more mass in them. So they could basically accrete pebbles through pebble accretion very rapidly um, to form Jupiter's core, which after about 1 million years was large enough to open up a gap. And then after another 4 million years, it, it basically completely accreted its, its gaseous atmosphere. So this is sort of the formation sequence that we anticipate for Jupiter. Um, if we take a look at what we expect from Earth, um, then it's very similar, except Earth formed inside of the snow line. So it didn't have this large, as much solid material available to it as Jupiter did. So its first planetesimals couldn't form very quickly by pebble accretion. They had to form by the slower core accretion that we talked about, where you, you basically take planetesimals and collide them together and very slowly through this inefficient process build up your planet. Because of this, Earth takes a longer time to form. So it's only half completed at about the, the 3 million year old mark um, in, in the solar system's formation. And it takes actually until um, like 100 million years after formation before Earth is 100% formed. So you have these, these two different processes, one of which gives you a very massive gas giant and one of which gives you something like Earth.
So the question is, how does this explain the differences that we see between the solar system um, and extrasolar planets? So if we go back to our diagram where we had the, um, the uh, planet size distributions, um, remember that we would have expected not to see Jupiter um, very often because you only see Jupiter in 1% of the cases. So if we didn't have Jupiter, uh, or what, what is the effect that Jupiter has on the terrestrial planets that form? Um, that's the question that we need to ask ourselves. So if we look back at Jupiter and what it does to the disk, um, we saw that there's mixing in the early part of the disk, then Jupiter forms and this blocks the flow of material from the outer disk. So essentially Jupiter creates this gap in the disk and at this inner edge of the gap, that effectively acts like a sieve. So if you take a bowl, um, if you take a pot of boiling pasta and you want to, to empty the pasta um, into the sink, so you dump it into this sieve, you'll basically collect the solid pasta there and let the, the water drain through, but no, no pasta is making it through into the sink. So if you have something in your sink that wants pasta in order to eat, it, it's going to be starved basically because you won't, you won't be getting any pasta through that. So because of this, Earth remains small um, and uh, yes, so Earth, Earth is starved, it remains small um, and doesn't grow into something like a super Earth in size. Um, one effect that this would have is that this may explain why you have so many gas giants in the outer disk because there's more material from them to form. You could easily start to form another gas giant here and have it rapidly form into something like Saturn and then do the same thing at the edge of Saturn's gap and form Uranus or Neptune going out. Um, and one other effect that it should have is that because you don't have this mixing between the carbon rich outer disk and the carbon poor inner disk, Earth should be poor in, in carbon and other elements that you would typically find in ices. And so we can actually look for this if we, if we uh, study geology. We can see what the composition of Earth is. And in fact, Earth is actually missing carbon. So Earth is mostly composed of, of iron and other rocky elements that take up 99% of, of its mass. And this includes oxygen because you can see oxygen um, in rocks as well as in ices. But the other elements that would include carbon make up less than 1% of the mass of Earth. And if you take all of the objects that we've been looking at, comets as well as asteroids and Earth, and you put them on a, on a scale where you look at the amount of carbon that they have as a function of their distance from the sun, um, and you fit a trend line to that, you can actually see that Earth has less uh, carbon than you might predict just on the basis of the, the comets and some of the, the asteroids, which argues in favor of Jupiter basically cutting off its supply of, of fresh carbon from the outer disk. And carbon's really important because it actually is one of the, the uh, it makes up like nine and a half percent of our of our body. So it's, it's a really important uh, element for life. And this the fact that Earth was cut off from carbon may have changed how life evolved on Earth or like how, how quickly life occurred on Earth, the form that life took, things like that. Um, so it may have actually required that we had uh, carbon delivered via an asteroid or cometary impact with Earth in order to, to have life start. Um, and if we think about what this means, the fact that Jupiter uh, basically caused Earth to form the way it did, what this means for other um, planetary systems. So if you don't have Jupiter, then you might be much more likely to have something like a small Neptune form instead. So suppose you don't form Jupiter, you form something smaller, then that smaller thing won't create as big a gap. So it'll be much less efficient at keeping material back from the inner disk. So any terrestrial planets that you form might actually form larger than Earth in a shorter period of time, and they would might, might be more likely to form carbon-rich super-Earths. Um, so this can sort of explain why these two categories are much more frequently seen in exoplanet surveys. Um, and it leaves one important question, which I can't answer here, 
but it's an important thing to think about. And it's something that will be interesting to see in the next uh, few decades. What would a carbon rich planet mean for life or a more carbon rich planet than what we see on Earth? Would it mean that life arises easier? Would it mean that um, that you, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know what it would mean, but it would be definitely something that's interesting to think about. Um, and a lot of people who do astrobiology are thinking about it. Um, so briefly, if I still have a little bit of time, um, let's take a look at how the solar system's history compares with other, uh, the, the history of other planet forming disks, basically. So we know if we study other disks, that we can see uh, gaps in these disks, even at fairly young ages. So this is an example of a disk called HL Tau, which is in one of the nearer star forming regions to us in, in Taurus. And it has these gaps and rings. Um, it was observed with this telescope called ALMA, which is this fan fantastic set of, of over 60 different radio dishes that observes in the Atacama Desert. It looks at radio where submillimeter to millimeter wavelengths, which are close to radio, and it maps cold gas and pebbles in protoplanetary disks. So if we look at the sample of disks that ALMA has looked at, we can see that 33% of these very young disks at these ages have uh, pebbles already, um, which could indicate that they are ready to form planets. And if we think that Jupiter needed to, to form early in order to get to the size that it did rather than forming a small Neptune, this is a critical element of, of making sure that we can form Jupiters. Then this also means the flip side of this, that 67% of young disks can't form Jupiters. So these disks might be more likely to form something like a small Neptune and a super Earth combination. Um, which could start to explain why you see this bias toward these, these mid-sized planets. Um, so there, there are the, the gaps and holes that are in these young systems, the, the ones that do show gaps and holes suggest that maybe in these systems, a gas giant has already formed, but the number of disks that show gaps is smaller than the number of disks that have pebbles. So this is beca becoming, indicating that Jupiters are more and more rare. Um, many mature disks do have gaps, but if these were later forming, then this might mean that they couldn't reach Jupiter's final size um, and they might stop at something that was smaller than, than Jupiter. Um, there are also mature disks that don't show any gaps or rings, and it's not clear at this point whether this is because we just haven't looked hard enough for them, like we, we haven't observe them with high enough uh, image quality with ALMA to be able to, to detect these gaps or rings, or maybe they actually are smooth and they're just forming super earths and we wouldn't expect to see any rings. Um, so one thing you can take away from this is that large disks that have more pebbles can probably form Jupiter sized planets early enough that you could actually successfully make Jupiter. And some appear to be doing this. Smaller disks with fewer pebbles probably could only form small Neptunes, or maybe they, they actually start, um, maybe small Neptunes occur because planet formation started later. Um, we really need more complete statistics on disks with ALMA to be able to tell whether mature uh, disks are actually smooth and whether these could produce super Earths. So that's something to be done in the future. Um, one of the things that I've studied recently is, um, trying to identify whether we can detect these carbon poor inner disks that could form Earth-like planets. Um, and I've done this for one disk called TW Hydra. TW Hydra is an 8 million year old disk. It's the closest disk to Earth, so it's really easy to, to detect because it's bright, because it's closer. Um, and it shows these gaps in it. Um, and one of the gaps right here at the inner part of the disk is sort of a, a good analog to where we think Jupiter would have formed um, in the solar system in the sense that it, it's just at the water snow line for this system and it cuts off the inner disk and, and we wanna see what that means. Um, so these are potential locations where you could have gaps for planets. Um, and if there is a planet here, it would basically mean that you, you would get um, hold the solids back and deprive the inner disk of, of carbon. Um, and we can observe the gas uh, in the inner part of the disk to sort of, the gas is like the analog for the water that's draining out of the disk. The water from the pasta um, would have some starch in it, but the bulk of the pasta would be left behind. So if you measure the amount of starch um, 
in the water, you could infer how much pasta you had. And similarly, if you measure the amount of carbon in the gas in the inner disk, you can infer what the carbon content was in the solids that were left behind in the outer disk. Um, so when I do this, we see a few things. Um, and this is the most detailed that I'll get, hopefully. So first, the icy elements. Um, if, if we look at this, this diagram, you have the elemental gas abundance on the y-axis and the different elements on the, the x-axis. So carbon is right here. And you can see that carbon is one of the icy elements. And it's depleted. You, you, it's missing carbon by about a factor of 100. Um, if we look at the rocky elements, they're missing by about a factor of 10,000, which is really big. Um, and the pattern that we see in how the elements are missing is similar to the pattern that we see in meteorites. So you can see it's like this mirror image. You see um, carbon is missing, nitrogen is missing a little bit less, you have some oxygen, and you get a, a similar pattern in the meteorites. So if we look at all of this, we can say that the amount of nitrogen that's missing indicates that you had to have one um, uh, uh, planet form in the outer part of the disk that's holding back some uh, nitrogen rich ices. And you see that there is a uh, some oxygen that's missing and that suggests that there is a planet that's holding back oxygen rich uh, material here. And the fact that you also see um, missing uh, rocky and metal elements suggests that there's a, a third potential planet inside here that's holding back those rocky elements. Um, so this may suggest that we have an inner trap that's forming carbon poor Earth-like planetesimals and an outer uh, pebble trap that's forming something like nitrogen rich planetesimals that would be similar to Pluto. Um, so basically, we know that our solar system is a space oddity, but there may actually be uh, similar planetary systems that are out there. So our solar system is not alone. Now, I'm pretty sure I'm under some time pressure by this point, but where do we go now from here? I have like three, three or four more slides just on future things that will help to answer this question, and then we have the conclusions. Um, so in the future, basically starting this year, we're going to have a series of solar system experiments and also uh, telescope observations that will ba basically give us a lot of information about um, how we continue with this problem to determine uh, how common our solar system is and what it means for, for life to have formed. One of the things that will happen this year, actually it already happened last year, was that um, the uh, Japanese Space Agency sent a probe to a, uh, a very primitive asteroid and it scooped up a sample and came back and that sample arrived back on December 5th of last year. It was like one of the few good things to happen in 2020 was this probe coming back and, and successfully delivering its material. That material is being analyzed right now in labs around the world. At the same time, NASA had a similar probe that went to an asteroid um, scooped up its sample and is coming back in 2023. So with this material, we'll actually be able to test for real how much carbon these asteroids have, because some of the carbon could have been destroyed on atmospheric reentry of these meteorites. So if we want to know how much carbon we, we actually have, we need to go back and, and observe it in place in situ in these, in these objects. Um, the other development will be that the James Webb Space Telescope will launch this fall. And James Webb is a joint NASA, European Space Agency, Can Canadian Space Agency infrared telescope. Um, it'll launch in October on Halloween, trick or treat. Um, it has a five to 10 year lifetime. Um, and there's actually a lot of uh, Dutch astronomy that's going to be done with this. So I'll just highlight um, a, few, a few programs from, from Leiden University where, where I work. So. There's guaranteed time that will go to studying uh, gas and dust in protoplanetary disks that's led by Avina Vandeshuk. And I have a set of three programs that will all try to answer the question, how do uh, icy materials that form in molecular clouds get into comets? And what does that mean for, for planets that form using these materials? Um, so it will answer the question, how much ice are comets born with? And um, these gas phase observations from the Guaranteed Time program will um, answer the question of what material like water and carbon ends up in the terrestrial planet forming region. 
So to observe these ices, we can basically use, um, look at cold things um, that are sitting in front of hot things. And then the cold things will create an absorption feature in the light that, that comes through from the hot thing behind it. So basically these dips here in, in the spectrum all correspond to different ice species. So we can observe these kind of uh, uh, basically brightness as a function of wavelength uh, spectra for molecular clouds, protostellar envelopes, and disks, and then use that to trace how much ice we see at each of these stages right before the ice gets incorporated into comets. Um, and if we zoom in on this part, the inner part of the disk, the terrestrial planet forming region part of the disks, we see that we'll actually be able to detect in the gas phase these uh, sharp spectral lines. And these correspond to, in some cases, water and carbon dioxide. So we'll be able to see how much water and carbon dioxide exist in the gas in protoplanetary disks. And if we take that in combination with observations of exoplanet atmospheres, like they talked about one or, one or two Kaiser lectures ago, um, you can actually observe exoplanet atmospheres when they, when they transit or pass in front of a star. And you get these uh, features that have similar absorptions in them due to water and CO2 and, and methane. Um, and note again, water and CO2 are both part of this. So we can make a direct comparison between the water and CO2 that we see in exoplanet atmospheres and the water and CO2 that we see in protoplanetary disks to say something about where these, uh, these planets were when they formed their atmospheres. Um, and this will even be possible for super Earths, like, like this example here, with the James Webb Space Telescope. So we should get detailed compositions of super Earths to see where they formed. So to summarize um, and conclude, um, our solar system isn't normal compared with other planetary systems, not at all. Um, it's not normal because it has a solar type star with a gas giant, and it's also not normal because we have four terrestrial planets and four really big gas giants at once. Um, so it's a great place to be, but it's definitely uh, not normal. So um, it might be that uh, early pebble accretion allowed Jupiter to form very quickly. And because it formed so quickly, this starved all of the inner planets, the terrestrial planets, and prevented them from getting very big. Um, we are able to test this scenario by trying to trace carbon-bearing materials and water in different parts of protoplanetary disks and different uh, in, in, in atmospheres of planets. Um, and it's not clear what impact the fact that Earth has so little water and carbon had on the development of life. Maybe it hindered it, maybe it helped it, we don't really know, and this is a, an interesting question going forward. Um, we're starting to build evidence that there are similar processes to what happened in the solar system that are at play in external protoplanetary disks. Um, so in the case of TW Hydra, we, we see that there are um, signs that you have this massive gas giant, small terrestrial planet potential dichotomy going on. So it could be like the solar system. Um, in other systems, we see that they are either very too small to form Jupiter or they remain smooth, so they don't have any gaps. So maybe those are more likely to form super Earths or small Neptunes. That's an open question still. Um, and finally, future experiments like what we saw with the sample return missions in the solar system and JWST observations will help us answer the remaining questions that we still have um, on this topic. So thank you very much for, for giving me your attention for so long. Sorry I ran over. Um, like I said, I'm excited about this, so uh, I talk a lot. But I hope you guys are excited too. Thanks. Um, well, at least I, I am very excited about this, so. You did a great job, I think. Thank you a lot for it. Um, before we go to the questions, I want to say a few words for the last time. Uh, firstly, I want to emphasize something that I find really important, and that is how amazing it is to have a female speaker here today. Although women are becoming less rare in the academic world, we are still very much underrepresented. And uh, for me, as a young-to-be scientist, I find it very encouraging to see how much a woman can achieve in the world of astronomy. So thank you for that, Dr. McClure. You're welcome. 
And well, moreover, I'm not done thanking people. So I want to thank my committee members, Mike, Marike and Shravia. I'm really proud of you and proud of us, of what we have achieved. And uh, I enjoyed working with you a lot. So thank you for all the fun meetings. And I promise that this time I will make a datum pricker for our committee outje in time. So, and then last but not least, I would like to thank everyone at home for watching and donating and all the support and love that we have gotten. We couldn't have done it without you. So hopefully we will see you next year. Thank you. We can go to the question now. Uh, yes, we do have a lot of questions from the audience. The first of which is, doesn't local source material variations in the disk play a big role in determining the outcome of collisions, for example, accretion versus fragmentation? So the, the, you, you mean the composition of the source material or the size? Or, uh, let me just answer both. So, so basically, the the size matters a lot because if you're colliding things that are similar sizes, then you're much more likely to to fragment than the, than if you're colliding one big thing and one small thing. Um, also, the velocity, the relative speed between the two colliders matters a lot. It's true that the composition of the colliders does matter. For example, if they're icy, like water ice, water ice sticks much better than if you just take rocks and collide them. Um, so this is part of why uh, you're, you're exactly right that if you form things in a region of the disk where, say, you're beyond the snow line, um, where Jupiter is thought to have formed, that's one of the reasons why it's easier to form Jupiter quickly beyond the snow line, because it's water ice rich. So there, not only do you have more mass to, to build Jupiter, but it's also stickier mass. So it's like you're colliding, you know, gumballs, sort of like chewed up gumballs rather than rocks, I guess. It would be a way to think of it. Hopefully that answers the question. How do you distinguish meteors from normal rocks with the naked eye? Hmm. So in the case of the iron rich meteorite, you know, it was it was kind of obvious that it had like this sort of um, smooth, but a little bit pebbly metallic outside, like it just looked different. Um, but it's really hard for things like the, the achondrites and also the chondrites because unless they have a thick fusion crust from from burning up in the atmosphere it can be difficult to distinguish them so that that's part of why there are fewer of um so there cer certain types of of the meteorites are easier to distinguish than others the ones that are like sort of stony um, and not very processed are are very hard to to distinguish from from other from earth rocks so this is um yeah they have people who specialize in going out and looking for these things because they're they're experts in detecting them. Whenever meteorites travel through the atmosphere, they react with oxygen and start burning, increasing the heat of the rock. How much could this process potentially affect the chemical composition of the meteorite? So I'm just going to say I'm I'm not my area of expertise is not specifically in meteorites. So the the degree it's absolutely true that this does affect it and this is part of why these sample return missions are so valuable because we want to actually like they they go to the the asteroid they scoop up really original material it's stored in a, a controlled temperature controlled environment and brought back to earth and we analyze it there without having anything burn up so that's like good that's the gold standard for for this kind of analysis um it's, it's absolutely true that with meteorites, you always have this uncertainty about whether there was alteration that happened in the atmosphere. There are presumably tests that you can do to compare the ratios of different elements and the ratios of different isotopes of specific elements to, to check how much processing there was, but that's not my, my subfield. How do you determine that a planet has fully stopped forming? Don't they always keep on changing in Sunday and thus are never really done? Yeah. So for for the gas, this is this is true. You 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 can absolutely like continually add more material um, onto planets. And in fact, we do. There's this period in our solar system's history called the late heavy bombardment, where you have a bunch of like asteroids and comets that just hit. The planets one after the other and cause these big craters on them. So you're never really done. But there's a point where 
where you're basically you're not gaining much more mass and each of these impacts actually um, has the potential to remove more mass than, than it adds. Um, and that's that's sort of what we're talking about with the terrestrial planets when we set like 100 million years after their formation as the limit to when they formed 100% of their size. For, for the gas giants, it's pretty clear that once you, you remove the gas in the disk, which you can do by draining it onto the central star or blowing it out back into the cloud, um, that once you have no more gas, that's sort of the end of when you're forming your planet's atmosphere. Um, so there's a much harder cutoff there. Does the formation model include consideration for particles slash grain rotation spin velocity in addition to neutral orbital velocity for collisions? Um, which which model? I mean, so in terms of the pebble, so yeah, so there, there are certainly numerical models that will take all of these things into account and um, produce some predictable observations. Uh, I, so I, I, I think the, the answer to your question is yes, that's taken into account. Um, it's, it's much more detailed than, than, I, than I want to get into here. What can I expect to learn from, the, from research on this topic in the near future? So I, I think what we're going to um, that was what I was trying to to get at with the the, the future observations uh, section. So I think we know a lot about the solar system already, but but as as we said, there's this caveat that um, that you really need to go and actually absorb observe the the primitive materials. Um, from the asteroid without having it travel through the Earth's atmosphere. So having these sample return missions will, will be huge for our understanding of what the actual gradients are chemically in, in the disk. Um, and in the next few years, I think we're going to have um, first an assessment of how much ice we actually see in protoplanetary disks. This is one of the things that my group is working on through the, the JWST programs that I have. Um, and we'll also see in a again, a small sample of disks, um, whether it's likely that the terrestrial planet forming region um, was, was actually, whether it had carbon and water in potentially in solids like baked into the rocks or whether they were really only available, those elements are really only available to um, to the forming terrestrial planets through through the, the gases in the atmosphere, in which case we need cometary delivery. So we're going to have a really complete inventory of both the dust and gas in the terrestrial planet forming region coming out of JWST. So those will be really big things um, in the next few years. And then if you look at the targets for JWST for exoplanets, um, most exoplanets that have been characterized right now are, are these very large Jupiter planets that are close to the central star, so hot Jupiters. And they're not really that applicable to like formation of life questions because they're hot and they're gas giants. Um, but with JWST, we're going to be able to, to get a lot of these super Earths and, and many Neptunes and start to, to sort of figure out what the, the differences compositionally are between those two systems. That's a huge thing that's going to come out in the next few years. And we just basically, with those observations, keep pushing down toward more Earth-sized planets and getting as detailed information about the atmospheres and solid properties as we can. Uh, is Mars more rich in carbon than Earth? Um, so this is something that this is an interesting question. Um, we actually, so I, I sort of glossed over this a little bit. Even with Earth, we don't really know the complete carbon content of Earth because some carbon can actually make it into the, the core by chemically binding with iron. Um, so generally speaking, when you look at the, the mantle and the crust material, Mars has a little bit more carbon content than Earth. Not a whole lot, a little bit, but there's this question of whether, like, you could hide a lot of carbon in the core, and that's something that's very hard to take into account. It's really an open question right now for for geophysicists. <laughs> 
Most orbits for, for planets are elliptical. Why do the orbits of the 2B planets in the protoplanetary disk look circular? Uh, so, okay. You mean in the, in, in the, assuming you're referring to TW Hydra with that, that very circular ring system. Um, so generally speaking, having the gas in the disk actually damps down the eccentricity of solid particles that are moving around. So most of the eccentricities that you would see in planets are thought to have arisen after the gas disk went away. Um, so that's that, and, and even within disks, you can see a little bit of, of eccentricity sometimes, but you need very high resolution data, but they're, they're fairly circular because of the gas. Uh, how much of the bias in exoplanet statistics due to the inherent sampling bias says in the observation techniques part of what makes our solar system seem not normal? I, I think it's it's probably a big bias. So as I said on that one slide, um, the the distribution that we, we had on that slide was specifically for planets that are um, observed to have orbits that are less than 100 days, so within the orbit of Mercury. And this is due to the, the way that we observe these planets. So we mostly have to observe them in edge-on systems because then they have a higher radial velocity signature or they pass in front of their star and we can transit and get information on them that way. So um, for planets that are further out, um, we, we don't really have a good handle yet on their properties. We haven't detected as many of them and they're they're harder to observe. So I think there is a, a pretty big bias here. Um, and that's part of why studying protoplanetary disks is such a useful tool because those come in all different inclinations. Um, and we can see there, if, if, if we find a way to basically calibrate the signatures of planet formation in disks, then we can get more information about the planets that are further out than we could get from observing exoplanets. Will it be a matter of months or years after the launch of the James Webb telescope before you expect breakthrough results? I think we're going to have breakthrough results in cycle one. So, so basically cycle one starts, there's a six month commissioning window, and then we start getting science back um, at that point and cycle one lasts for a year. So there are, um, it depends on whether you mean breakthrough results specifically for, for the, the questions raised here or whether you mean in, in general. But um, the programs that I mentioned are going to be observed in cycle one. So we should have these results back within 12 to 18 months after uh, the start of science operations at the six month mark. Uh, is Late stage giant planet migration, like in our solar system, something believed to be common in other planetary systems? Yes, it is. Was there a follow up on that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so the, 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 um, the, the answer is that we see signs of migration um, in the final positions, the semi major axes of many different types of planets in, in mature exoplanet systems. So there's these. For example, the, the, um, uh, there's systems, systems of tightly packed inner planets, or STIPS, if you ever see that acronym, which are essentially systems like the TRAPPIST-1 planetary system, where you have multiple super-Earths and mini Neptunes um, stacked very, very closely together within the orbit of Mercury. Um, and these are thought to have been the result of migration of, of these planets that formed further out at the water ice snow line or just inside the snow line. And they migrated in and then basically stopped at resonance positions with the innermost planet. Um, so you see this, this is a signature that you see in, in the large samples of observations that, that we have for exoplanets. Okay, I believe we are done with the questions. Cool. All right, thank you guys for asking them. This has been really fun. Uh, yeah, thank you again for taking your time to answer all these questions and for the people interacting.